Hi, everyone. Hello. Hold on. We got to get her up. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold on. Welcome there. back to another week of reading. Um, welcome to Fun and Friends. My, happy, name, is, my oh. name is Avalon. I'm Sabrina. And I'm Jasmine. Um, happy Memorial Day. We want to say thank you to all the service people who have put their life on the line for us to keep us safe. And God bless America. Before we get started, got to give them a shout out for today. Yep. Okay. All right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this. All right, we're going on to chapter three. Okay, quick recap. At the end of last chapter, oh, yes. we did have them finally get kidnapped. I guess there really is a fairy tale mm -hmm. world after all. <laughs> and they ended up at the schools they did not expect to end up at. <laughs> wow, it was a pretty good recap. Good one. I like it. Yep. Keep it up. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> She's like, I was practicing. Go I was prepared me. for this. My moment. college abstract writing had me prepared. <laughs> <laughs> college. I wish that was a joke. <laughs> oh, mm. Let's get my hair out of the mic so that it actually yeah, makes no, sense. <laughs> okay, it probably doesn't sound like that. <laughs> Even sounded like that, I'd be a little concerned. Yeah. <laughs> Chapter three. The, the great... wind licks is, is, a, is a description that actually is used, but I don't think it sounds like that. No. Chapter three, the great <laughs> mistake. Look to her for her. What? It's an expression in writing where, like, if the wind's really blowing, your hair's in your face, then all your hair is licking, licking your face, like whipping, licking your face. I need my camera. Anyway. Chapter three, the great mistake. Sophie opened her eyes to find herself floating in a foul-smelling moat filled to the brim with thick black sludge. A gloomy wall of fog flanked her on all sides. She tried to stand, but her feet couldn't find the bottom, and she sank. Sludge flooded her nose and burnt her throat. Choking for breath, she found something to grasp and saw the carcass of a half-eaten goat. She Lovely. gasped and tried to swim away, but she couldn't see an inch in front of her face. Echoes screamed above, and Sophie looked up. Streaks of motion, then a... dozen bony birds crashed through the fogs and dropped shrieking children into the moat. When their screams turned to splashes, another wave of birds came, then another, until every inch of sky was filled with falling children. Sophie glimpsed a bird dive straight for her, and she swerved just in time to get a cannonball splash of slime in her face. She wiped the glop out of her eye and came face to face, to face with a boy. The first thing she noticed is he had no shirt. His chest was puny and pale, without the hope of muscle. From his small head jutted a long nose, spiky teeth, and black hair that drooped over his beady eyes. He seemed like a sinister little weasel. <laughs> the bird ate my shirt, he said. Can I touch your hair? <laughs> Sophie backed up. I would too. <laughs> I'm back up to you. Some creep. Can I touch your hair? They don't usually make villains with princess hair, he said, dog paddling up towards her. Sophie searched desperately for a weapon, a stick, a stone, a dead goat. Maybe we can be bunk mates or best mates or some kind of mates said inches from her now. It was like Radley had turned to a rodent and developed courage. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. He reached out his scrawny hand to touch her and Sophie ready to punch to the eye when a screaming child dropped between them. Sophie took off in the opposite direction and by the time she re glanced back, Weasel Boy had gone. Through the fog, Sophie could see the shadows of children treading through the fog floating bags and trunks hunting for their luggage. Those that had managed to find them continued downstream towards the ominous howls in the distance. Sophie followed these floating silhouettes until the fog cleared to reveal the shore. There a pack of wolves standing on two feet in blood red soldier jackets and black leather breeches snapped riding whips to herd the children, the students in line. Sophie gasped grasped the bank to pull herself out but froze when she caught her reflection in the moat. Her dress was buried beneath the sledge and yoke. Her face shined with bl stinky black grime and her hair was home to a family of earthworms. She choked for breath. Help! I'm in the wrong school! A wolf yanked her out and kicked her into the line. She opened her mouth to protest but saw Weasel Boy swimming up for her, yelping, Wait for me! <laughs> Quickly, Sophie joined the line of shadowed children dragging their trunks through the fog. As Annie dawdled, a wolf delivered a swift crack as she kept anxious pace all, all the while wiping her dress, picking out worms, and mourning her perfectly packed bags far, far away. The tower gates were made of iron spikes crisscrossed with barbed wire. Nearing Welcome them... Home. <laughs> Welcome to your new home. 
nearing them, she saw it wasn't wire at all, but a sea of black vipers that darted and hissed in her direction. With a squeak, Sophie scampered through and looked back at the rusted words over the gates, held in two carved black swans, the school for evil edification and propagation of sin. Ahead, the school tower rose like a winged demon. The main tower, built of poshmarked black stone, unfurled through smoky clouds like a hunking torso. From the sides of the main tower jutted two thick, crooked spires, dripping with viny red creepers like bloody, bloodying wings. The school's... The wolves drove the children towards the mouth of the main tower, a long serrated tunnel shaped like a crocodile's snout. Sophie felt chills as the tunnel grew narrower and narrower until she could barely see the child in front of her. She squeezed between two jagged stones and found herself in a leaky foyer that smelled of rotten fish. Demonic gargoyles pitched down the stone rafters, lit torches in their jaws. An iron statue of a bald, toothless hag brandished an apple smoldering, smoldered in a menacing firelight. Along the wall, a crumbly column had an enormous black letter N painted on it, decorated with wicked-faced imps, trolls, and harpies climbing up and down it like a tree. There was a blood-red E on the next column, embellished with swinging goblin, uh, giants and goblins creeping along the inter interminable line. Sophie were, worked out what the columns spelled out. Never. Then suddenly found herself far enough into the room she could see the line snake in front of her. For the first time, she had a clear view of the other students and almost fainted. One had a hideous overbite, wisps, patches of hair, and one eye instead of two, right in the middle of her forehead. Another boy was a mound of dough with a bulging belly, bald head, and swollen limbs. I think it's a so Right! This is the Pillsbury Which Doughboy. Which they don't ever put on advertisements anymore, but back in the day in like the he early used to be 2000s. everywhere. I feel like he got um he got thinner as time went on. Well the the Pillsbury Doughboy company had like this white marshmallow looking dough boy with a little chef's hat and he'd be really really big and the joke was like dough boy you would poke his belly and he would go Hee. and now they don't have that on any of their advertisements anymore. Hot twist that's the marshland staple of marshmallow's child as and the other child. one went to evil school. <laughs> there we go. But that's what we refer to as a Pillsbury yeah, Doughboy. From Ghostbusters. Yeah. yeah. Basically. A tall, sneering girl trudged ahead with sickly green skin. The boy in front of her had so much hair all over him, he could have been an ape. They all looked about her age, but the similarities ended there. Here was a mass of miserable and misshapen bodies, repulsive faces, and cruelest expressions you could ever seen. As if looking for someone to hate. One of... One by one, their eyes fell on Sophie, and they found what they were looking for, the petrified princess in glass slippers and golden curls, the red rose among thorns. On the other side of the moat, Agatha had nearly killed a fairy. She had woken under red and yellow lilies that appeared to be having an animated conversation. Agatha was sure she was the subject, for the lilies gestured grotesquely to her hair with their leaves and their buds. But then the matter seemed settled, and the flowers hunched like fussing grandmothers and wrapped their stems around her wrists. With a tug, they yanked her to her feet, and Agatha gazed out over the field of girls, blooming gloriously through the shimmering lake. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. The girls grew right from the earth. Heads first poked out of the soft <laughs> dirt, then necks, then chest, then up and up until they stretched their arms to the fluffy blue sky and planted delicate slippers upon the ground. But it wasn't the sight of sprouting girls that unnerved Agatha the most. It was that these girls looked nothing like her. Their faces, some fair, some dark, were flawless and glowed with health. They had shiny waterfalls of hair, ironed and curled like dolls, and they wore downy dresses of peach, yellow, and white, like fresh batch of Easter eggs. Some oh fell gosh. on the shorter side. Others were wiry and tall, but all flaunted their tiny waists. Don't be a backseat reader. Slim legs and slight shoulders. As the field fla flourished... Hi. Hey. Good, how are you? As the field flourished with new students, a team of three glitter-winged fairies awaited each one. Chimming and chinking, they dusted the girls off dirt, poured them cups of honey brush tea, and tended to their trunks, which had sprung from the ground with their owners. Where exactly these beauties came from, Agatha hadn't the faintest idea. All she wanted was a... Was a 
puzzle. <laughs> Door and disheveled one to poke through so she didn't feel so out of place. But it was an endless bloom of Sophie's who had everything she didn't. A familiar shame clawed at her stomach. She needed to make a hole to climb down, a graveyard to hide in, something to make them all go away. That's when the fairy bit her. What the? <laughs> <laughs> Agatha tried to shake the jingling thing off her hand, but it flew and bit her neck, then her bottom. Other fairies tried to subdue the rogue as she yawned, uh, yowled, but it, beat, it bit them too and attacked Agatha again. Incense, she tried to catch the fairy, but it motioned lightning quick, so it hopped around un uh, hopped around uselessly while it bit her over and over until the fairy mistakenly flew into her mouth and she swallowed it. <laughs> Agatha oh sighed in relief and looked up. <laughs> I love how she sighed with relief too. She's and then like, she's gonna look around. And everyone's gonna be horrified. I love that. You just ate a fairy. How could you? Whoops. Sixty beautiful girls gaped at her. The cat in the nightingale's nest. Agatha felt a pinch in her throat and coughed out the fairy. To her surprise, it was a boy. <laughs> it was a boy. It was a boy. Okay. I'm I'm assuming a boy fairy instead of a girl fairy. Oh, gotcha. You know what I mean. In the distance, sweet bells rang out their spectacular pink and blue ca glass castle across the lake. T the teams of fairies all grabbed the girls by their shoulders, hoisted them into the air, and flew them across the lake towards the towers. Agatha saw her chance to escape, but before she could make a run for it, she felt herself lifted into the air by two girl fairies. As she flew away, she glanced back at the third, the fairy boy that had bitten her, who stayed firmly onto the ground. He crossed his arms and shook his head, as if the if to say under no uncertain terms there had been a terrible mistake. When the fairies brought the girls down in front of the glass castle, they let go of their shoulders and let them proceed freely, but Agatha's two fairies held on and dragged her across like a prisoner. Agatha looked across the lake for Sophie. The crystal water turned to slimy moat halfway across the lake. Gray fog obscured whatever lay on the opposite banks. If Agatha was re to rescue her friend, she needed to find a way to cross the moat. But first she needed to get away from these winged pests. She needed a diversion. Mirrored words arched across the golden gates ahead. The school for good, enlightenment, and enchantment. Agatha crossed her reflection crossed her reflection in the letters and turned away. She hated mirrors and avoided them at all costs. Pigs and dogs don't sit around looking at themselves, she thought. Moving forward, Agatha glanced up at the frosty castle doors emblazoned with two We're white... about to have an interruption, just so you know. Okay. Two white swans. But as the doors opened, the fairies herded the girls into a tight mirrored corridor that the line came to a halt and a group of girls circled her like sharks. They stared at her for a moment as if expecting her to whip off her mask and reveal a princess underneath. Agatha tried to meet their stares, but instead... <laughs> <laughs> it was, this is just the disguise. <laughs> but instead, met her own face reflected in the mirrors a thousand times and instantly glued her eyes to the marble floor. A few fairies buzzed to get the mask moving, but most of the girls perched on the girls' shoulders and watched. Finally, one of the girls stepped forward with waist-length gold hair, succulent lips, and topaz eyes. She was beautiful. She didn't even look real. Hello, I'm Beatrix, she said sweetly. I didn't catch your name. That's because I never said it, said Agatha, eyes pinned to the ground. Are you sure you're in the right place? Beatrix said, even sweeter now. Agatha felt the, the words swim into her mind, a word she needed, but it was still too foggy to see. Um, I, uh, perhaps you just swam to the wrong school, smiled Beatrix. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> the word lit up in Agatha's head, diversion. Agatha looked up into Beatrix's dazzling eyes. This is the school for good, isn't it? The legendary school for beautiful and worthy girls destined to be a princess? Oh, said Beatrix, lips pursed. <laughs> so you're not lost? Or confused, said another with Arabian skin and jet black cast. Or blind, said a third with deep ruby curls. <laughs> It's so Merida and Princess Dazzin right there. Right. right. <laughs> In that case, I'm sure you have your flower ground pass, Beatrix said. Agatha blinked. My what? Your ticket to the flower ground, said Beatrix. You know, the way we all got here, only officially accepted students have tickets to the flower ground. 
all the students held up their large golden tickets, flaunting their names in regal calligraphy, stamped with the schoolmaster's black and white swan steel. Oh, that flower ground pass, Agatha scoffed. She dug her hands into her pockets. Come close and I'll show you. The girls <laughs> gathered suspiciously oh, Lord. while Agatha's Jeez. hand fumbled for a diversion. Matches, coins, dried leaves. Um, closer? Murmuring girls huddled in. It shouldn't be this small, Beatrix huffed. Shrunk in the wash, said Agatha, <laughs> scraping more and more matches, melted chocolate, or a headless bird. Reaper hid them in her clothes sometimes. It's in here somewhere. Perhaps he lost it, said Beatrix. Mothballs, peanut shells, another dead bird. Or misplaced it, said Beatrix. The bird, the match, light the bird with the match. <laughs> <laughs> or lied about having one at all. Oh, I feel it now. But Agatha felt her n nervous rash around her neck. Um, you know what happens to intruders, don't you? Said Beatrix said. Here it is. Do something. Girls crowded around her ominously. Do something now. She did the first thing she saw to, thought of and delivered a swift, loud fart. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's just... An effective diversion creates both chaos and panic. Agatha delivered on both counts. Vile fumes rippled through the tight quarter of squealing girls stampeded for cover, and fairies swooned at the first smell, leaving her a clear path to the door. Only Beatrix stood in her way, too shocked to even move. Agatha took steps towards her and leaned in like a wolf. Boo! Agatha fled for her life. Er, sorry, Beatrix fled for her life. As Agatha sprinted for the door, she looked back with pride as the girls collided into walls and trampled each other to escape. <laughs> Fixed on rescuing Sophie, she lunged through the frosted doors, ran for the lake just, but just as she got to it, the waters rose up in a giant wave and with a tidal crash, slammed her back through the doors and threw no, the screeching girls go. until she landed um, on her stomach in a puddle. This reminds me of the scene in Lord of the Rings with Gandalf. You shall not pass! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> she staggered to her feet and froze. Welcome, new princess, said a floating seven-foot nymph. It moved aside to reveal a foyer so magnificent, magnificent, Agatha lost her breath. Welcome to the school for good. Sophie couldn't get over the smell of the place. As she lurched across the line, she gagged on the mix of unwashed bodies, mildew, and stone, and the stinking wolf. Sophie stood on her tiptoes to see where the line was headed, but she could see it was an endless parade of freaks. The other students threw her a dirty look, but she, but she responded with a kindest smile in case this was all a test. It had to be a test, or a glitch, or a joke, or something. She turned to the gray wolf. Not that I question your authority, but might I see the schoolmaster? I think he... The wolf roared and soaking her in spit. Sophie didn't point, uh, press the point. <laughs> she slumped into the line into a uh, sunken enter, enter room where three black cricket staircase twisted into a perfect row. One carved with monsters and malice along the banister, the second etched with spiders and mischief, and the third with snakes that read vice. Around the three staircases, Sophie noticed the walls covered with different colored frames. In each frame stood a portrait of a child next to a storybook painting of what the student became upon graduation. A gold frame had a portrait of an elfish little girl, and beside it a magnificent drawing of her as a revolting witch, standing over a comatose maiden. A gold plaque etched under the two illustrations, Catherine of Foxwood, Little Snow White, Villain. In the next frame, there was a portrait of a smirking boy with thick, with a thick unibrow, alongside a painting of him all grown up, brandishing a knife at a woman's throat. Lovely. Drogon of Murmuring Mountains, Bluebeard, Villain. Beneath Drogon, there was a silver frame of a skinny boy with shock blonde hair turned into a dozen ogres savaging a village. Knir of Nearwood, Tom Thun, Henchman. When Sophie noticed a decayed bronze frame near the bottom of 
a t with a tiny bald boy, eyes scared wide. A boy she knew, Bane was his name. I got it. <laughs> He used to bite all the pretty girls in Galvedon until he was kidnapped four years before. But there was no drawing next to Bane, just a rusted plaque that read... How did they say it spelled Bane? B-A-N-E. Okay. That's that, how they spelled it too. I was spelling it wrong. <laughs> just a rusted plaque that read, failed. Sophie looked at Bane's terrified face and felt her stomach churn. What happened to him? She gazed up at thousands of gold, silver, and bronze frames cramming every inch of the hall. Witches slaying princes, giants devouring men, demon igniting children, heinous ogres, grotesque organs, headless horsemen, merciless sea monsters, once awkward adolescents, now portraits of absolute evil. Even the villain that had died a gruesome death, Rumpelstiltskin, the, uh, the bean, beanstalk giant, the wolf from the Little Red Riding Hood were drawn in their greatest moments as if they had emerged triumphant from their fairy tales. Sophie's gut took another twist as she noticed the other children gazing up at the portress in awed worship. It hit her with a sick clarity. She was in line with future murderers and monsters. Her face broke out in a cold sweat. She needed to find a faculty member. Someone who could search the list of enrolled students and see if she was in the wrong school. But so far, all of she could find were wolves that couldn't speak, let alone read a list. Turning the corner into a wider corner, she saw a red-skinned, horned dwarf ahead on a towering stepladder, hammering more portraits onto the bare wall. Her teeth clenched with hope as she inched towards him in the line. As she plotted to get his attention, Sophie noticed, suddenly noticed the frames on this wall held familiar faces. There was a hoggish doughboy she had seen earlier labeled Brone of Rockbriar. Next to him was a painting of a one-eyed, wispy girl, Arachne of Foxwood. Sophie scanned the portraits of her classmates, awaiting their villainous transformation. Her eyes stopped at the weasel boys. Hort of Bloodbrook. Hort. Sounds like a disease. She moved ahead in line, ready to cry to the wolf. She saw a frame under the hammer. Her own face smiled back at her. With a shriek, Sophie bolted out of the line, fumbled up the ladder, and snatched the portrait from the stunned dwarf's fingers. <gasps> no! I'm in good! She shouted, but the dwarf snatched it back and the two tossled over the portrait, kicking and clawing until Sophie had enough and gave him, him a slap. The dwarf screamed like a little girl and swung at her with his hammer. Sophie dodged it and lost her balance, and the stepladder teetered and crashed between the walls. Splayed out on the rungs midair, she looked down at the snarling wolves and goggling students. I need the schoolmaster! Then, then lost her grips, slid across the ladder, and landed in a heap in front of the line. A dark-skinned hag with a massive boil on her cheek thrust a sheet of parchment into her hands. Sophie of Woods Beyond, Evil, year, First Year, Malice Tower 66. Session, Uglification, Faculty, Mr. Bilbus Manny. Number two, Henchman Training, Caster. Number three, Curses and Death Traps, Lady Lesso. Number four, History of Villainy, Professor August Stadler. Number five, Lunch. Six, Special Talents, Professor Sheba Sheiks. Seven, Surviving Fairy Tales, Yerba the Gnome. Forest Group, number three. Sophie looked up dumbstruck. See you in class, Witch of the Woods Beyond, the hag crackled. Before Sophie could respond, the ogre dumped a ribbon-tied stack of books into her hands. Best Villainous Monologues, Second Edition, Spells for Suffering, Year One, The Novice's Guide to Kidnapping and Murder, Embracing Ugliness Inside and Out, How to Cook Children with New Recipes. The books were bad enough, but then Sophie saw the ribbon tying them was a live eel. She screamed and dropped the books before a spotted satyr foisted musty black fabric at her. Um, Unfurling it, Sophie shrank from a dumpy, tattered tunic that sagged like shredded curtains. She gaped at the other girls, gleefully putting on the putrid uniform, combing through her, her school books, comparing schedules. Sophie slowly looked down at her own foul black robes, then at her eel-slimed books and schedule, then at her smiling sweet portrait back on the wall. She ran for her life. Agatha knew she was in the wrong place because even the faculty gave her confused looks. Together, they lined the four spiral staircases of the um, cavernous glass foyer, two of them pink, 
to blue, showering confetti upon the new students. The female professors wore different colored versions of the same slim, high-necked dress with glittering silver swan crest over their heart. Each had added a personal touch to their dress, whether inlaid crystals, beaded flowers, or even a tool bow. The male professors, meanwhile, all wore bright, slim suits in a rainbow of hues, paired with matching vests, narrow ties, and colorful kerchiefs tucked into their pockets, embroidered with the same silver swan. Agatha noticed immediately they were all more attractive than any of the adults she had ever seen. Even the older faculty was elegant to the point of intimidation. Agatha had always tried to convince herself beauty was pointless because it was temporary, but here was the proof it lasted forever. The teachers tried to disguise their nudges and whispers upon seeing the dripping wet misplacement student or misplaced student, but Agatha was used to catching these things. Then she noticed one who wouldn't wasn't like the rest, hollowed against the stained glass window like a shamrock green suit, silver hair, and shiny hazel eyes. He beamed down at her as if she completely belonged. Agatha reddened. Anyone who thought she belonged here was a loon. Turning away, she took comfort in the glowering girls around her, who clearly hadn't forgotten for the incident in the hall. Where are the where are the boys? Agatha heard one other and heard one ask another as the girls filled in in front of the three enormous floating nymphs with neon hair and lips, who handed out their schedules, books, and robes. As Agatha followed the line behind them, she had a better look at the majestic stair uh, stair room. The wall opposite her had an enormous pink painted E with lovely drawn angels and uh, sylphs fluttering around the edges. The other three walls were painted letters too, spelling out the word ever in pink and blue. The four stair spiral staircases were arranged symmetrically at the corners of each wall, lit by a high stained glass windows. One of the two blue flights had honor tattooed upon the banister along with glass etchings of knights and kings while the other red valor decorated with blue reliefs of hunters and archers the two pink glass staircases had purity and charity emblazoned in gold along the delicate frenzy frenzies of sculpted maidens princesses and kindly animals in the center of the room alumni portraits blanketed a soaring crystal obelisk that reached from marble milky marble floor to a domed sunroof higher up the obelisk were gold framed portraits of students who became princes and queens um, after graduation in the middle of the silver frames for those who found lesser fates as jaunty sidekicks dutiful housewives and fairy godmothers and near the bottom of the pillar flecked with dust were bronze framed underachievers who had ended up as footmen and servants but regardless of whether they became snow queen or chimney sweep agatha saw the students shared the same beautiful faces kind smiles and soulful eyes here in the glass palace in the middle of the woods the best life had gathered in the service of good and here she was miss miserable in the service of graveyards and farts <sighs> agatha waited with bated breath until she finally reached a pink haired nymph there's been a mix-up she panted dripping with water and sweat this is my friend sophie who's supposed to be here the nymph smiled i tried to stop her from coming agatha said voice quickened with hope but i confused the bird and now i'm here and she's in the other tower and i'm pretty she's pretty and likes pink and i'm well look at me it, i know you need students but sophie's my best friend and then she stay if she stays then i have then i then i have to stay i have to stay and we can't stay so please help me find her so we can get home the nymph handed her a piece of parchment agatha of the woods of beyond good year one purity tower 51 session beautification professor emma anemone princess etiquette pollux animal communication princess uma history, history of heroism professor august sadler lunch Good Deeds, Professor Clarissa Dovey, Surviving Fairy Tales, Yuba the Gnome, Forest Group 3. So I want to be in charge of animal communication. This is my new goal to be the instructor. If you're like, um, can <laughs> you take me? When are you retiring, Miss? <laughs> can no? I um, go please and teach that, please? Yes. <laughs> the Privileges of Beauty, Winning Your Prince. Oh, sorry. The green-haired nymph thrust her a basket of books, some peeking out. The Privilege of Beauty, Winning Your Prince. The Recipe Book for Good Looks. Princess with a Purpose, Animal Speech, speech 1, Barks, Nays, and Chirps. 
Then a blue-haired nymph held up her uniform, an appalling short pink pinafore, sleeves poofed with carnations, worn over a white lace bodice that seemed to be missing three buttons. Stunned, Agatha looked at future princesses around her, tightening their pink dresses. She looked at the books and told her beauty was a privilege, and she could win a chiseled prince that could, if only she could talk to birds. She looked at the schedule meant for the beautiful, graceful, and kind. She looked up at a handsome teacher, still smiling at her, as if expecting the greatest things from Agatha of Galvedon. Agatha did the only thing she knew how to do when she faced, uh, was faced with expectations. Up the blue honor staircase with sea green halls she ran, fairies jangling furiously behind her, hurtling through the halls, scrambling up the stairs. She made no time to take in what she was seeing. Floors made of jade, classrooms made of candy, a library made of gold, until she reached the last staircase and surged through the frosted door into the tower roof. In front of her, the sun lit up the breathtaking open air topiary of sculpture, sculptured hedges. Before Agatha before Agatha could even see th what the sculptures are made of, fairies smashed through the door, shooting her with sticky golden webs from their mouths to catch her. She dove She dove to elude them, crawling like a bug through the colossal hedges. Finding her feet, she sprinted and leapt for the tallest sculpture of a muscular prince raising his sword high above the pond. A pond. She scaled the leafy sword to its prickling tip, kicking away squirming fairies. But soon there was too many, and she just sat there and s as they spat their glittering nets. Agatha lost her grip and crashed into the water. When she opened her eyes, she was completely dry. The pond must have been a portal because she was outside now in a blue, a crystal blue archway. Agatha looked up and froze. She was on the end of a narrow stone bridge that looked through thick fog into the rotted tower across the lake, a bridge between the two schools. Tears stung Agatha's eyes. Sophie! She could save Sophie! Agatha! Agatha squinted and saw Sophie running out of the fog. Sophie! Arms outstretched, the two girls dashed across the bridge, crying each other's names. They slammed into an invisible barrier and ricocheted to the ground. Dazed by pain, Agatha watched in horror as the wolves dragged Sophie back to the... the eh, by the hair back to the evil. You don't understand! Sophie screamed, watching the fairy snare Agatha. It's all a mistake! There are no mistakes, a wolf growled. They could speak after all. Well, <laughs> that sounds like your worst nightmare. <laughs> just, or, you know when you have those bad dreams and you're like running away and all you, that's all you can do and yep. you just don't win and then until you wake up. Exactly. Yeah, it's definitely stressful. I feel like it was kind of a, a filter chapter. Like, um, yeah. it was kind of explaining a lot about the um, background of how everything works. Exactly. Like, um, just them arriving at their schools and um, <laughs> just what their schedules are going to be like and what their books are going to be like. Yeah. yeah, and that they can't get to each other. Yep. Yes. Well, we're going to move to the other part of the deck <laughs> where it's a little bit more quiet. Okay, but we'll see you guys all there, okay? <laughs> Bye. Bye. Next time. See you next time.